Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to our first Western Film Roundup panel of stars, the first of two. We'll have one tomorrow afternoon at this time. I'm the moderator, Ted Reinhardt, and uh, I do regret we don't have enough seats for our vast audience here. So you uh, who are trying to get seats here, just stand to the back and perhaps someone will relinquish his or her seat during our presentation here. Uh, at this time... the question. First of all, are really Pee Wee King and Cal Shrum good friends? And if they are, how long have they been such? Gentlemen, there's the microphone. Who's Pee Wee King? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, I still got the mic. You, your turn is up. <laughs> Pee Wee, old money bag, that's who. <laughs> well, truthfully, I've known Pee Wee about, what, 40 years? able to call this bushwhacking coyote a friend. Say something I, good now. I said something about the I, I, I can't say anything bad. I don't know you that well. <laughs> <laughs> no, these, Cal and his brother Walt Shrum were kind of my idols. I used to shine shoes and peddle newspapers to go see them in movies. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, he went out to California. I know we, I went out there in 38 to do Gold Mine in the Sky with Gene, and right after that I met Cal and, and Walt, and they were broadcasting in the, uh, oh, not, not Oklahoma City. Denver, Colorado. Denver, Denver area, that's where it was. We, we played the, uh, the Brown Hotel, the Brownstone Hotel there, I guess it was. And that's where I met up with uh, Cal and Walt. And since then our friendship has blossomed and bloomed and faded. <laughs> but now it's been coming back again. <laughs> you might as well hang on to the microphone there. Uh, sir, that adequately answers your question then, right? Yes, All right. Uh, if I may just deviate momentarily, we have a photographer from, from Collier's Magazine here, and she's unfamiliar with the operation. There's a little switch there, and a little light will pop up, ma'am. Or are you with, are you with uh, Liberty? She's with Liberty Magazine. Oh, I thought She's she was <laughs> with Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> Cal is the uh, woman's hey. home companion. Ex <laughs> they make the, the, hold on. Do you want to hang on to this, Tom, just a oh. moment? I'm going to help this lady in distress. All right, fine. Okay. You know, okay. more. I know Ted. <laughs> you want me to do the pitch now? Yes, go ahead. Do your pitch. <laughs> Oh, did I yes, turn the mic yes. on? Well, I'm Wait, just someone, fixing to do the pitch, but did, that's all right. Did someone want to know what a Tommy Scott is? What is a Tommy Scott? Uh, oh, what is a Tommy Scott? <laughs> yes. He's a snake oil salesman, so. <laughs> does somebody have a question for Tommy? Dick, Dick Kaufman does. Dick Kaufman. Well, I'd just like to ask him about uh, Tim McCoy. I know he could go on for hours, but then he could just tell us a little bit about Tim McCoy. 
Yes, Tim. Uh, and mention first how you started this relationship with Tim. With Tim. Well, I was out on the coast, and uh, uh, I met Tim uh, down on a movie set there one time, and he said, you know, I'd like to travel with a message. I'll tell you a little story about Tim that a lot of people and a lot of you collectors might not know. Tim McCoy never did pitch medicine, but he financed a medicine show one time. And Buffalo Bill uh, sold medicine at one time. I don't know whether you knew that or not either. And, and Tim, one thing he swore he'd do, it out, he would live longer than Buffalo Bill, and he did. And I think he's really uh, financed the medicine show because of Buffalo Bill. He, he idolized Buffalo Bill. And so he later came on my show to, to do 13 weeks. We signed a contract. And uh, he to stay, he was to stay 13 weeks, and if he liked, he'd stay longer. And uh, at the end of the 13 weeks, we shook hands, and he stayed 15 years with me up until he died. And uh, that's the story of Tim McCall. We, he made, uh, uh, it, during this time, I think about 3,700 performances with me on the road. And he drove his car at that time, as old as he was, Tim, drove his car from town to town. And, of course, we opened the 1st of January, played 350 different towns a year. And Tim McCoy made all, for all the whole 15 years, he made 300, an average of 350 different towns a year by the time he's got medicine show. So Tim was a pretty good uh, man uh, right up to his 87th year when he passed on. And incidentally, he was on television uh, on uh, uh, Tom Snyder's show, uh, like on a Friday or something, and he passed away uh, like on the f following Monday. And I used to tell Tim, I said, you old SB, when the great medicine man in the sky pushes the button, I hope you've just walked off stage and they can still, uh, you can still hear that applause. And it almost happened that way. He passed on and uh, uh, he was a great guy. He was really a great human being and, and, a, and a, just one of the finest human beings you could ever meet and work with. That's when you find out about him. That, that weeds the uh, men out from the boys when you work with them for that long. You know what I mean? Actor too, he was. Yes, he was. And them steel eyes, they all remembered it, you know. <laughs> the icy stare. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Tim was a great, great guy. He really was. I think Tom deserves a hand for that, don't you? Yes. yes. Right. Ruth. Yes, he was a real colonel. Tim used to say that a lot of uh, people went to, cow uh, went to Hollywood to be uh, actors and, and do cowboy things. And he said he was a military and a real cowboy that went to Hollywood. And he knew absolutely nothing about acting. He said, I just do what comes naturally. But he was a real colonel in the Army. Yes, he was. A retired colonel, incidentally, right up to the end. Right. Uh. I want to go on record right now uh, apologizing to Ted Reinhardt for calling him Wendy. <laughs> he did it too. <laughs> <laughs> this Tommy is official. Scott is the champion. <laughs> this, this is Thank now. you, Wendy. Okay. That, that, that's the nature of my business, you know. <laughs> I'm now off the hook. No longer do I have, uh, can I claim that, that title? All right. Thanks, Cal. Right. How about some more questions? More questions, folks. Yes, ma'am. The cows run. My dad told me to hit the road when I was about seven or eight. <laughs> Not really, but before I get into that, I want to say something about Tommy Scott. Here's a guy, all kidding aside, that I've known professionally for years and years and years. I used to play theaters all over the United States and see his trailer on the screen coming and all that sort of stuff. And I never did meet the man till today, but I sure was a pleasure when I got to shake that side winding's hand today. Tommy, pleasure. <laughs> I've told this thing a thousand times about uh, my brother Walt and I going out to Hollywood on this radio station in KOA in Denver and wanting to make a movie with Gene Autry because we'd seen all these other guys in, with bands, you know. And we went out to Hollywood and couldn't get past the front gate and back again. And we went the second time and almost, we just about lost everything. We had instruments and all. But we did get back out of Hollywood without getting into the studio. Then we got back to the radio station, started playing personal appearances, playing the Tower Theater in Kansas City. One day, got a note from a gentleman. He said, I want to come back and talk to you. If you got a minute, he signed his name, Saul Siegel the producer of the Gene Autry pictures. 
and he says I like you guys man if you get back to Hollywood we'll put you in a new picture coming up with a gene called the old barn dance and man right there I said the boys we just booked about 20 some uh, one nighters I said boys we're going back to Hollywood I damn near got shot right there see? <laughs> but we did go back and Saul Siegel gave me a note to get us through the gate and we showed the note to the gate got back they called Gene and Smiley Joe Kane and uh, all the gang there they, we played a couple of songs and they said that's it and that was the way we got in the movies true story hey, Who's calling who? Talk a lot. <laughs> Let's get back in the back room, mix him up some hokum, and let him do the pitch. Right <laughs> you give him some of that medicine, and you're going to stay here all night listening to him. I don't know. Our, Pee -wee. our producer, <laughs> Hal Harmon, has got his hand up. I don't know if he wants to leave the room or what. <laughs> Well, I did a couple of things. I had to go out and book all of the shows, and then I'd come back and MC the programs, and then I'd have to go in, we played a town, I'd have to go in and see the theater, or not the theater, but the restaurant, pick out a restaurant and go in and make arrangements for the gang to eat till after the show, before we could pay them, because we didn't have any money. Lucky to get enough money for the gas, and we used to do that day in and day out because we didn't make enough money in, in these small towns to get further than the next town. So we'd go into a restaurant and say, hey, we got a whole bunch out here and sign a ticket. We'll, after the show, we'll pay you tonight. And we didn't, never did get turned down and we never left town without paying our bills at the restaurant. That could be a true story because the boys at the Grand Ole Opry did the same thing, except one thing. We had the radio advertising that we used at WSM to plug and announce our dates. We didn't get paid for our radio shows, and we should have been, been getting paid because we were the first band ever that belonged to the union when it came to Nashville. They wouldn't accept our cards, so we had to stick our cards back in our pocket for a few weeks, then finally they decided they'd let us join, uh, I mean, belong to their local that they had at 257 there in Nashville. So, in the interim, when Mr. Frank would book a schoolhouse, say, Wart Race, Tennessee, or, or Woodbury, Tennessee, or McMinnville, he'd also try to find one for a couple weeks later, and we'd put up our own window cards. We'd have the posters printed, tack them on the, on the telephone poles and all that. And a lot of times when, uh, We'd be tacking up the cars. We'd forget the name of the school, and we'd leave it empty till we found out what the name of the school was. We're going to play it in that town two or three weeks from then. But as I said earlier today in the conversation, those were lean days and lean years, and Tommy can tell you about them too. Yeah, that that was that was great times though back then. You know, you it know, was fun. It was fun, right? It was absolutely great times back in those days. I, I'm, I'm glad I was back in those days. I'd kind of hate to go back now and do it all over again, but, but it was really fun back in those days. I couldn't go back. No, I know what you. No, I don't think there, uh, what, what has happened uh, in the last, I'd say 10 years, maybe a little longer, the record companies, and I'm not putting the record companies down, believe me, they, they're, they're, they're necessary, but the record companies conceived the idea, take a Ricky Skaggs, for instance, he's from East Kentucky, how many people will go and send a New York or a California agent to, uh, to East Kentucky to scout a boy like Ricky Skaggs. In case you don't know Ricky Skaggs, he is the newest member of the Grand Ole Opry and one of the most aspiring young men to come along with what we call country music. But anyhow, the record company found out about him. They signed him up to a contract, made sure. They, they pick out somebody that's got the strength and the stamina and they know is gonna be loyal for at least a couple of years because once he gets smart, takes them smart pills and he learns how to do what we all had to do, put up the window cards, book your own show, 
arrange your program accordingly, what to fit the show or, or schoolhouse or whatever you played. Then they put out a campaign on him. They s set aside a half a million dollars, and they send him on the road with his album. He contacts all the disc jockeys in the top 40 stations. Top 40 stations are playing it because they get paid for it. The record companies have a, a way of, of finagling around that they buy advertising. So this boy goes through this whole bit. He becomes a star. They told him he's a star. The record company said, you're a star. He gets a manager. He gets an agent. He, they forget, you gotta have a lawyer. You can't sign the contract without the lawyer. Then he gets a band, he gets a bus, he buys the costumes. And they front, give them upfront money, as we were talking last night, upfront money. And at the end of two or three years, he gets a letter from Uncle Sam, says, hey, you owe us some tax money. And he says, well, I didn't get it. They said, you, it's doled out to you, Ricky Skaggs, you owe Uncle Sam a half a million dollars you, you got from the record company. He said, we spent it all. He says, well, where's your receipts? He said, I don't have any, I have a bookkeeper. And they tried to call the bookkeeper. Well, that bookkeeper went crazy the first six months he was booking the hillbilly. He didn't know what that was. So he quit. They got another one. He quit. And the first thing you know, the boy's in trouble. Then they drop him. I'm just using Ricky, for instance. Then the poor kid, he was a star for a couple of years. And then all at once, they dropped him. And what happens? He either goes to drugs or drinking, or he commits suicide. That's the story. It's a sad part, but that's how things really happen, really. Now, if he, get, if he goes to the routine that we all had to go through from the beginning, learn to play an instrument, learn to sing, learn an act to make pictures, you learn it by yourself. Nobody taught you. You pick up everything, and you learn to be a businessman. So when I said we were all poor at the Grand Ole Opry when we started there, and there's still a lot of poor boys there, but then there's a lot of rich ones, boys who learn how to manage their money, like Eddie Arnold, Roy Acuff, Webb Pierce, Marty Robbins, boys like that, they had their manager, but they were in control. Yes? He was including no, I, your name amongst those you <laughs> named. Oh, no, Bob, I was one of the lucky guys. I had a good manager. He later became my father-in-law, and uh, of course, uh, he's revered at the Grand Ole, uh, Grand Ole Opry. He was one of G. Daughtry's first managers also, Mr. G. L. Frank. But, uh, those managers are gone today. T today, the record company picks out who's going to manage them. There'll never be another Joe Franks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bob, you have a question? Smiley was a <clears throat> terrific guy to start with, as everybody knows was around him. We got to be real good friends, and he used to come to our place in Illinois, and we lived on the lake while I was doing the radio back there. And he used to come back there, and he'd run the wife out of the kitchen. He said, while I'm here, I'll do the cooking. And that's the way it, it went on. And uh, I remember one morning in particular, I had to get up early, as I always did, to do my radio show, and I was back home by 7, 7.30 when the average person was just getting up maybe or something. Smiley was down on the dock fishing and he's sitting down there about like this. And I went down one morning and said, how are they biting? He said, I don't know. He pill, pulled up his pole and no hooks. He's just sitting there having a good time, see? <laughs> Waiting until I got home. But he was a good fisherman and a good cook. And he did that at our house many, many times. And I imagine for you we can say the same thing, but he was one Terrific guy. I'll never forget one time I was on the old uh, the toll road commission for the state of Illinois And they wanted me to get somebody to do a big Picnic for us all the members of the toll road commission. I said let's get smiley Burnett. He said go to it and uh, I finally found smiley in Oklahoma City and I'd left word to call and I no more and got home to one day and here was a call from smiley Burnett We had found him through his wife Dallas in Hollywood and he called me and the first thing he said he says 
What in the cat hair is my old buddy kind of trouble he's in that he's got to call the old frog to get him out of? And, and that's the way he started out. And I told him, and he was booked up and couldn't make the, the thing, and he talked and talked and talked, and I finally, I finally said, well, we better hang up. He said, hold what you got. He said, I'm paying for this call. And he talked on another 10 minutes. That's the kind of guy Smiley Burnett was. And Mr. Joe Frank and Gene Autry drove down to Smiley's home in Decatur, Illinois. And Smiley's daddy was a minister. And they didn't approve. Now, it was all right for Smiley to play instruments. He played every instrument that ever was invented, a saxophone, a piano, accordion, guitar, sang and yodel, make up songs, make up jokes, make up some of the scenes for the Western movies later on in life. But they had to convince Mr. and Mrs. Burnett that everything was all right, that Gene Autry was a Christian man also, Mr. Frank was a Christian man, and, and that Smiley wanted to come to work with Gene Autry, and that's how they got permission from his parents for Smiley to go on a road. And my first uh, uh, meeting with Smiley, I was very much impressed because he was always jolly, he was always a funster. And then after he made a few pictures and became frog on his own and a personality, he went to some of the small theaters. Instead of working the tours with Gene, he went out by himself. You've seen the man on the street who clicks the cameras and then hands you a ticket and six months later you'll get your picture back if you send a dollar. Well, Smiley was the creator of that for the cowboys or the sidekicks. He carried a camera, several cameras with him in the trailer all the time. And when he wanted to get rid of the kids after the matinee, he'd say, boys and girls, if you come backstage, I'll autograph for you and you can have your picture made with old frog. How'd you like that? And them kids, yay, they'd holler. And, and he'd go out in the alley by his trailer and he'd, then he'd get some guy to take pictures. With that little bitty guy he had with him, remember? Travel as a chauffeur and all that. Anyhow, he took the pictures. And Smiley says, now you take this coupon and take it to your mama and daddy and tell them to send 50 cents. And good old Smiley, old frog will send you your picture. And he got better service by building his own dark room in his home. He had a beautiful home there in Hollywood, and then right in the back he had his own workshop and everything. He made a dark room in there, and he served those kids those pictures, got them to them before he could even get them printed at a print shop, because he'd go home to Hollywood and start working on it, or else he had that fellow, I'm trying to think of his, he reminded me of Cannonball Taylor, I remember that. And that's how he come to be so popular with the kids. And one day, he made, a, made an interview and he said, just remember, I catered to the kids for one reason. Every 10 years, we got, 10, we got another generation of children. He says, you'll never run out of an audience. You got them all your life. Right. That's so true, right? <laughs> Tested milking cows. See, and and I won't admit have, up to this We really. didn't have. My, I, you I, eat the hand. Yes, oh, milked yeah. them by hand. That's 16 like, in the yeah. morning, 16 okay, at night. Yeah. And I tell a story that I was so grateful to my mom and dad for letting me grow up on a farm that to show my appreciation later in life, I gave mom a color television set and I gave dad, well, I was going to buy him a white sidewall tire manure spreader. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't That's find beautiful. one. <laughs> That's so I bought a, a milking machine, a surge milking machine, which they, oh, they make right out of Decatur, Illinois. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, the machine worked, the uh, milking machine worked fine, so did the television set. And of course I learned one thing, though, working in a barn. Especially when you clean out the chicken coop and you drop your bubble gum, forget it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> But when the, the surge milking machine broke down and the television set broke down, Dad fixed it himself. He got the tools out and worked on it for two, three days. And the night he put it together, we got 16 quarts of Perry Mason. That's the end of my joke. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, that's great. Well, Richard, we've gone past our designated time. Should we wrap, do a wrap? There, there will be another panel of stars tomorrow at the same time, so we can continue. We'll have more time tomorrow. Right now, we're kind of pressed because... Tommy's going to be on our show tonight if we have one. 
Oh, well, I certainly hope so. I'd like to ask you know, one little question. Go you ahead, Doc. Could. You, you're bothering me. You mentioned something about smart pills in your conversation a little bit ago there. Do you happen to have the formula to them smart pills? I'd like to <laughs> mix up a It so happened when I turned 65, I took the last one, and that was it. Oh, you've been hard <laughs> to catch ever since. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, because of this uh, time problem, we will have to wrap up, so you be sure to be here. Yeah, we're going to have an auction coming up immediately as soon as all the auction items are brought forth here. And wait, is it going to be in the front or are we going to have it in there? Oh, okay, we'll all venture into the, the, the uh, dealer's room and we're going to have an auction. Before you leave, this is a first, believe me. The moderator and the three stars are going to applaud the audience. We are. Thank you. The show will start at 7.30. After the auction, we'll come in here and we'll start our show. Thank you.